All right, everyone. Professor Sackett Taylor here, picking up with the video lecture, second half, on chapter eight, price level and inflation from principles of macroeconomics. In the last video lecture, we defined inflation and the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and talked about their relationship to one another. Now we're gonna talk about the cost to society as the result of inflation. And then we'll break these down over the next couple slides. So here's a master list oop, that we're looking at. Shoe leather costs, money illusion, menu costs, uncertainty about future price levels, wealth redistribution, price confusion, and tax distortions. Shoe leather costs are essentially, it's, um, it's based on an old adage where, oops, um, it was named because literally back in the day, people would have to replace their shoes from walking back and forth between their home and the bank so many times. But it's essentially like as prices go up, inflation, it becomes more costly to hold that money because if you have that money in hand and not in a bank and you experience inflation, the value of that money goes down, right? So money becomes more costly to hold when prices rise because it's going to be worth less tomorrow than it is today. So people try to spend, people spend resources trying to use that money today rather than holding on to it for tomorrow. Um, today, we're not so much walking to and from the bank, but it would include costs like multiple ATM visits, um, especially if you have ATM charges for every time you use an ATM. So it's essentially the cost associated with people bearing the time, the effort, maybe the fuel to, um, go to the bank often to try to use their money now while it's worth more. This is shoe leather cost. Money illusion. So this is um, a cognitive bias we have where people will interpret wage and price changes as real changes, even though they're not adjusting for inflation. So let me give you an example. Let's say prices and wages go up by 2% equally. Then really, since prices have gone up by 2% and the money that you earn has gone up by 2%, your purchasing power is the same, right? Like you might have technically more dollars in the bank, but they, they go just as far as they used to. So you don't actually have more purchasing power. Money illusion is the case where people do believe they have more purchasing power. So they're not taking into account that prices have also gone up, right? So if your wages go up and prices go up, you're not actually richer. But mistakenly, people believe they are because they have more dollars in the bank, even though their dollars don't go or go just as far, if maybe not even as far. So this is called money illusion, and it can lead to some poor consumption decisions. So let's just break this down. So the nominal wage, nominal, just like nominal GDP, is the wage measured in current dollars, right? The real wage adjusts that nominal wage for inflation. So the real wage is really a better measure of what a worker earns in terms of their purchasing power. So money illusion causes workers to irrationally focus on nominal wage, the number of dollars in their bank account, rather than real wage, which is their purchasing power, how far that money can go. And so people might insist, for example, that real wages are too high given price levels, um, and that could be a mistake. Um, this is an important takeaway for you as a student when you think about your first um, wage negotiations when you go on the job market, right? Because you need to make sure that your wages are going to be adjusted over time for inflation. So like, for example, 
um, all of the professors here at Westfield State University are on a union contract. Our union is the Massachusetts State College Association, the MSCA. And we negotiate every two to three years for a new contract. And when we, when our labor union goes to the table for negotiation, they are asking for increases in our salaries every year to account for inflation. So usually our increases actually don't account for inflation. Um, in good years, we've gotten a 3% increase, which we know is approximately in what inflation is when it's, you know, at a on a sustainable level. But when, when inflation is higher than that, it means that prices are going up faster than our wages are going up. So our purchasing power is actually going down. This past year during the pandemic, we only received a 1% increase in our wages. So that didn't match inflation. So over time, over this past year, prices have gone up and our wages have not gone up by the same amount. So the amount of money we make actually covers fewer goods, right? So um, you really... In, in practice, you want to deal with purchasing power. So you want to negotiate a wage that is going to be adjusted upward over time, hopefully, ideally tied to inflation. So and this is like another money illusion example for you. So let's say nominal wages, so the amount that you earn in dollars goes up by 3%, but prices go up by 5%. Well, money illusion might make you believe that you're wealthier because you see a bigger number in your bank account. You actually are making more money this year, but your real wage has actually decreased because prices went up faster than your wage did. Your purchasing power has gone down. So let's practice this. Suppose that prices and wages both double. What is true about next year compared to this year? Well, what we know is if prices and wages both double. So your wage is double. That means your nominal wage is higher, right? The amount of dollars in your bank account is greater. But your real wage has stayed the same because your wage and the price level increased by the same amount. So it's purchasing power. Think of real wages as purchasing power. So this brings me to a topic that wasn't originally in here by the textbook author, but I think this is a perfect place to talk about it. And that's minimum wage. Um, I think a lot of people experience money illusion when they hear that um, we, you know, places like Massachusetts are planning to raise the minimum wage to $15. Often the, the retort from people is, you know, oh, those people are going to be so much wealthier. But what we actually see if, if we have an economic lens on things is that minimum wage over time has not kept up with inflation. So even though the nominal minimum wage has gone up, real minimum wage has gone down because inflation has outpaced increases in the minimum wage. So this um, political move to increase the minimum wage now to $15 is actually just trying to adjust for losses to the real minimum wage that we've seen over time. This video can do a better job explaining the history of it. Let's watch. This is an American sweatshop. They flourished in the early 1900s when people were desperate for work. And since there were no regulations on what they had to pay, they paid workers next to nothing. So the US adopted something that had already worked in other countries, a minimum wage. This is a chart of the minimum wage in the United States over the past 60 years. You can see how it's gone up and up and up from a dollar an hour in 1960 to $7.25 today. Go America, right? But this chart is actually pretty misleading. If you take the same line, but adjust it for inflation, you'll see the problem. Every time the minimum wage has been raised, inflation has dragged it right back down. Really, America's minimum wage hasn't gone up. It's essentially stayed the same since the 80s. What you're seeing here, this constant up and down, this is weird. It's not how the rest of the world does it, and it leads to a bunch of problems for American workers and businesses. But it doesn't have to be this way. 
And the minimum wage sets the smallest amount that a business anywhere in the country can pay its workers each hour. But when that first bill became law in 1938, it had one big problem. That first law didn't actually set any kind of guidance on when and how you're supposed to raise the minimum wage in the future. That meant that if the minimum wage was going to go up, Congress would have to pass a new law. That's what these steps are. But as we already know, they aren't occurring enough to keep up with inflation. And this system also makes the U.S. minimum wage sort of unpredictable. Look at this period. Starting in 1997, the minimum wage sat at $5.15 an hour for 10 years. Then it was raised in 2007 to $7.25 by 2009. Cool, but that's a 40% increase in a pretty short time after a decade of inaction. How do you plan for that if you own a business? Not having that consistency does raise a lot of problems for business owners. Will they have to lay off employees? Will they have to reduce work hours? Um, or will they just raise prices on their customers? Imagine how much smoother that could all go if the minimum wage just kind of went up over time. Well, we don't have to imagine it. In France, they automatically raise their minimum wage every single year. They tie it to inflation in the average salary of a French worker. In Australia, a commission reviews the minimum wage every year, considering economic factors like inflation. The UK also has a commission made up of union business and economic experts. The Czech Republic's commission consults with employer and union representatives. Their line is lower overall than America's, but it still trends upwards. Same with Costa Rica, and their committee reviews the minimum wage twice a year. In most countries, the minimum wage is in the hands of economic officials. In the US, it's in the hands of politicians. And that goes about as well as you'd expect. Today, the federal minimum wage is a poverty wage. The last thing we need are more one-size-fits-all Washington mandate. It could eliminate up to 3.7 million jobs. It would lift 1.3 million Americans out of poverty. Raise the wage for 33 million people, a quarter of the workforce. Those wages are only available if you get hired. Working people are doing their job. Let us do ours. Republicans have generally resisted increasing the minimum wage. They, they tend to support a lot of pro-business policies, and the business leaders do not want minimum wage increases. Democrats, on the other hand, they have a lot of support from labor unions, so they're the ones who you're usually pushing for an increase to the minimum wage. So that's why Congress rarely agrees on raising the minimum wage, and what makes America's system different than other countries. This chart shows how much a minimum wage worker makes compared to the average worker in every developed country with a minimum wage. All these countries have some kind of commissioner formula to determine what the minimum wage should be, and they review it every year or two. And then there's the U.S., who does neither and is dead last. If the U.S. had done something similar, like tie the minimum wage to the average wage each year, we'd be here. Not amazing, but not an outlier. What we're talking about is the federal minimum wage, which applies to everyone who works in America. But states can set their own too, and about half of them currently have a higher minimum wage than the federal one, like Washington state, which in 1998 decided to raise theirs every single year based on inflation. Sound familiar? I mean, it's a, such a logical idea. Um, it's done in other countries. It really doesn't make sense why it's not done at the federal level. Like, really, it's just about politics. Right now, politicians are yet again debating what the minimum wage should be. Should it be $15, $11, or should it not be raised at all? But maybe the solution to this never-ending debate is to take the decision out of politicians' hands. What a wild idea, letting an economic indicator be determined by economists instead of politicians. This is so back to where we were. That's an issue with the money illusion component of the cost of inflation. Moving on to another problem that we see are menu costs. These are literally the cost of, of like reprinting menus. That's where the name comes from. But it's not just menus, right? Think about when prices go up over time, for example, a place like Walmart, as they increase their prices along with overall levels, they have to reprint all of their price labels, right? So that's using inputs, that's using resources, that costs the company money um, and costs them in labor hours because people have to be putting those labels on things, right? So the cost to Walmart is like paper, ink, printing machines, the workers, these are all menu costs. 
future price level uncertainty. So firms often have to make long-term agreements in the form of contracts that involve paying salaries to workers and paying back loans on any capital goods that they invested in. But uncertain inflation makes those long-term contracts kind of risky. So we don't know in those contracts, if we don't know the inflation numbers in advance, which we can't, whether workers are going to be underpaid or overpaid relative to inflation in the following year. Lenders might be fearful of lending out money today because they potentially could be getting less valuable dollars back in the future. So if long-term contracts are not actually entered in, GDP growth is slowed down over time. So we like long-term contracts, but uncertainty sometimes can lead us to hesitancy in signing those long-term contracts. So like, for example, would you be willing to sign a contract right now to be paid the exact same amount for the next five years? Depends on what you think is gonna happen with inflation. Uncertainty about prices makes borrowing risky. This brings us to the concept of wealth redistribution. So inflation can actually redistribute wealth between borrowers and lenders. So remember, when we have inflation, as prices go up, the value of each dollar goes down, right? Purchasing power goes down. You now need more dollars to buy the same stuff. So essentially the value of the dollar has gone down. So if you were to borrow money from a bank, at current prices, and then we experience inflation over time as you're paying the bank back, you're paying the bank back based on a certain amount that you borrowed, but the dollars you give back to the bank are worth less than they were at the time that you borrowed the money. So inflation actually redistributes wealth from the lender to the borrower. You're better off as a result of inflation if you borrowed money because you're paying back dollars that are worth less than they were at the time that you borrowed. So for example, let's suppose that you borrow $50,000 back or $50,000 and you have a five-year loan and based on the interest rate on that loan, you're expecting that you're gonna pay back $60,000 over the course of the next five years. If we see unexpectedly high inflation, you're going to be better off and the bank is going to be worse off because you're paying back dollars that have less value to the bank. If the inflation was expected by the bank, they may actually increase your interest rate to require more in return for the loan. For example, if they're expecting inflation to be pretty high and you borrow $50,000, they may set an interest rate that has you paying back $75,000 to account for the increase in price level and the devaluation of the dollar over time. On the other hand, if unexpected deflation occurs, so price levels go down, you're worse off and the bank is better off because when price levels go down, that means that the dollar becomes more valuable, right? You need fewer dollars to buy things. And so each dollar carries higher value, but you're still paying back the same number of dollars that you borrowed, but those dollars are worth more. And so you actually lose out on that if you, if you are experiencing an overall level of deflation. So let's practice what we know here. In 2012, Juan takes out a 30-year bank mortgage at a fixed interest rate. This is fairly typical. I have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. He buys the house with the loan. And then in 2014 to 2018, that period of time, which is right after he took out the loan, inflation is really high. So who is hurt and who is helped if we hold everything else constant? Well, the correct answer here is A. Juan is better off and the bank is hurt. This is because, <clears throat> like, let's suppose Juan borrowed $200,000 to buy the house. In the next few years, inflation causes housing prices to rise and the value of the dollar to fall. So Juan's house is now worth $250,000, but he still only owes the bank $200,000 that he borrowed, plus some interest. The bank is hurt because the money that it receives in the future from Juan as he pays back the loan is worth less than the money that he, they loaned him. The next cost is called price confusion. This is where um, 
we know that prices act as a signal in the market of the value to things for producers. So like, for example, the law of supply tells us that at higher prices, producers are signaled to produce more. But if higher prices are caused by inflation, they may make um, the producers might misinterpret this and actually expand their business faster than what is sustainable for them. So for example, if a price increase is the result of an increase in demand, then the correct response of the producer is to buy new resources, build new factories, and hire more workers. That is expand output. But if the price increase is just the result of inflation, you shouldn't be changing your output because all prices across the board are affected at every level. But if you accidentally read this as a signal to increase your output, this potentially could put you into a poor um, business management situation. Finally, tax distortion. So capital gains taxes are taxes that you pay if you um, gain money from selling an asset for more than what you purchased it for. So for example, um, I took out a very special loan on my first home that I bought in Holyoke and I got it. It was like a government sponsored loan and I got it at a really low interest rate and a low down payment because I was a first time home buyer. But because it was a government loan, I had to pay essentially a capital gains tax if I sold the home um, within a certain amount of time and made money off of the sale, which I did, um, because housing prices recently have gone up. So when I sold my, I bought the house in Holyoke for like 184. And then three years later, I sold the home for 210. So I made, you know, 25, $26,000 off the sale of that home, which is a capital gain. And I was borrowing money at a really low interest rate from the government. So the government said, I want some of that back, right? This is a capital gains tax. The problem with this is that if prices are rising over time for due to inflation, um, rather than increasing in the value of the good. So housing prices went up over time, not necessarily because the value of the home went up, but because of inflation. Then um, what's happening is that I would have to pay a significant tax on based on just the difference in prices, even though it's not based on value that I put into the home. So What's good here is that oftentimes um, this tax is determined by inflation and is not tied to our general tax code. Um, but so like, here's an example. If I buy a house in 1980 for $80,000, I sell it in 2012 for $230,000, I've made $150,000 off the sale of that home. You would have to pay a capital gains tax of, on that $150,000. But... That's assuming that, the, that 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 increase in what you sold the home for is tied to the value of the home itself. If the CPI rose from, let's say, a level of 80 to a level of 230 in those years, so if the CPI also rose by 150 points, then the real value of the house is the same and you're paying taxes on it, even though the value of the house hasn't changed. So if there had been no inflation, the homeowner wouldn't have owed any tax on this. Um, so in this case, um, it distorts the tax and the owner of the capital loses. So let's summarize. There are a bunch of costs to inflation, and this is why we like to keep inflation low, but not zero. Um, we have shoe leather costs, which are the time and resources that we spend on trying to get the resources to use our money now rather than holding on to it for later. Money illusion is a cognitive bias that consumers have where we interpret changes in our wages as being um, an increase in our wealth, but we don't always take into account inflation rates. And what we should be really looking at is purchasing power. Menu costs are the cost of businesses associated with having to change labels on all of their products over time. Future uncertainty 
um, leads to lenders being hesitant to lend money and borrowers being hesitant to sign into long-term contracts. Wealth redistribution is where, as a result of inflation, lenders are losing out because borrowers are paying back dollars that have lost value. Price confusion is where it's difficult for businesses to read price signals and know whether the price is a result of a change in demand and therefore they should expand output or whether the price is just the result of inflation. And finally, tax distortions. So when we gain on capital investment, inflation makes capital gains appear larger than they actually are, which increases the burden on, of the tax on the capital owner. Whew. So we know in general that too much inflation is bad, but no inflation really would be um, the result of no growth. So if we want some economic growth, we have to deal with some level of inflation. So where does inflation come from? What causes it? There's no debate about this. Inflation is caused by an expansion of the nation's money supply. Um, this is literally like how much money is circulating within an economy relative to the quantity of goods and services available and produced. Um, so inflation makes money less valuable, right? So Milton Friedman, um, who is a foundational like father of free market economics, says inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. It has to do with the amount of money in supply. So we can actually look at the relationship between money supply price levels, GDP, and the velocity of money. The velocity of money is the number of times that a single unit of money exchanges hands within a given year. It really represents the speed of currency circulation within an economy. So the quantity of money here given by the variable M is all paper currency and coins. Um, Money is basically like whatever we use to ex in exchange for goods and services. And so the velocity of money is the number of times that unit exchanges hands. And this um, product, the quantity of money multiplied by the speed at which it changes hands should be equal to the price level times the real level of GDP. Now, just to harken back to an earlier lecture, the price level, if we multiply price level times real GDP, what we get back is nominal GDP, right? So nominal meaning the total value of goods and services in a certain country during a period, certain period of time um, without accounting for inflation, right? So essentially what this is saying is that the money circulating through the economy should be equivalent to the relative production of goods and services in that economy, right? That's, and so what, the way that we use this equation for exchange is in solving for one of these variables if we have the other three, right? So if we know the quantity of money available and we know the current price level and the current real GDP, we can solve for the velocity of money. We can see how fast it's moving. Also, if we know the quantity of money and how fast it's moving and we know real GDP, we can solve for the current price level, right? Like one more time, if we know the velocity of money, the price level and GDP, we can solve for money supply. So this just gives us um, what's called like an identity equation of once you have three of the variables, you can always solve for the fourth. We can then change these into, in, we can then use these as percent changes with like a few mathematical tricks to arrive at growth rates. So if we assume the velocity of money is constant, not changing, right? The, the rate at which money exchanges hands um, is unchanging. And so that would mean that the percent change in the velocity is zero. Then we could draw the following conclusions, right? So that means this percent change in velocity is zero. So that would mean that the percent change in the money supply is equivalent to the percent change in price level 
or inflation, plus the percent change in GDP. So what we can see here is that, what this means, the percent change in price level is inflation. So inflation will be positive if the growth rate of the money supply is greater than the growth rate of GDP. In other words, inflation occurs when the money supply grows faster than production, right? Inflation is negative. In other words, deflation occurs when the change in production, change in GDP is higher than the change in the money supply. And we would have zero inflation if the money supply and, the, and GDP grew at the exact same rate, which they almost never do, right? So in general, we tend to have positive inflation, low but positive inflation, around three to 4%. This means that our money supply, the amount of currency available in an economy is growing at a faster rate than the value of all the production of goods and services in the economy during that period of time. So more money than products. That's what causes inflation. We can see here that there's a really positive correlation between money supply growth rate and inflation. So countries like the United States that tend to have in general, a low, gro low growth in our money supply. We also experience really low inflation. But then um, we see that countries like Turkey, where they have a much higher growth in their money supply, also experience much higher rates of inflation. Um, up here in the like Democratic Republic of Congo, Angola, this is like hyperinflation, runaway inflation. And it's really a result of growth in the money supply. They're pumping currency into the economy too fast that it's really outpacing the growth of their production economy. And so the result is hyperinflation. So why do we increase the money supply? Why do governments do this? Well, inflation has significant costs, but there's still reason to increase money supply. Um, we increase money supply to deal with large government debt. Usually what that means is that we literally print currency or just change numbers in a computer to give banks more access to free or co low cost money to pay off government debts. Um, or we can use money supply to temporarily stimulate an economy. So if the economy is lagging and people are not buying and selling things, we could put more money out into the economy to get more transactions happening. Both of these reasons are very tempting but for sh very short-sighted goals. However, right, because like we can increase money supply to solve debt problems, we can increase money supply to solve slowdowns. This is all short run though, because we risk having very serious long-term consequences such as hyperinflation or prolonging a recession if we don't pull back on money supply growth. So in conclusion, what I want to reiterate here is that the average person in the United States really does not understand inflation. Um, inflation is, is calculated based on the consumer price index, which is the foundation of what people, the average American is buying in a specific period of time and how much those purchases are making up of total expenditure. So this is a computation that is really difficult because the typical basket of consumer goods is always changing. Um, but this is done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and they're constantly adjusting their formulas. The cost of inflation to the economy on the macroeconomic scale includes price uncertainty, um, signaling problems for businesses, menu costs for businesses, and money illusion biases for consumers. So what we're going to do in class is I'm going to show you a couple of videos about money that I think some people would find 
kind of mind blowing when you understand how money supply really works. I think that we have this like really beautiful little story we tell ourselves about money and how it's held in the bank and someone is like, you know, protecting it in a vault and that's where all of our money sits. Money is not as tangible as that in our current economy, um, in the world that we live in now. And so understanding the back end of what's really happening with the money supply um, is something that gives you a peek into the economist's lens that the average person is, is, is not getting. So I'm really excited to show you this video and see what your reactions and reflections are on it. So to be continued in class, I'll see you then.